So I'm Adam Parks. I'm a modeler and hydrologist at Jacobs, and I'd like to take this opportunity to spend a bit of time talking to you about um, 2D modeling using Flood Modeler, how you do it, why you do it, um, and uh, and the advantages of those that approach. So what we're going to look at today, first off, are the uses of direct rainfall modeling. So what sort of studies, what sort of uh, um, uh, projects you'd want to use direct rainfall modeling uh, for? What the benefits and limitations of direct rainfall modeling are, as well as touching uh, briefly on some of the alternative options you can consider. We'll spend a, a good chunk of the time looking at exactly how you do this within Flood Modeler. So it's a great interface. It's really easy to use. So I'm going to build uh, live some direct rainfall models and some infiltration models uh, to show you how to do that. We're going to look at some uh, some new features that are coming in the next release of Flood Modeler. So the, the next big release is version five uh, towards the end of the year. I know some great things coming in there which should really help us with these sorts of problems and finally at the end we've got some questions i can see from the uh, the box we've already got some questions coming in but we'll have a, a few minutes at the end for, for questions if there are any before we start looking at uh, direct rainfall modeling it's probably uh, worth looking at the, the traditional approach so what would you normally do so this is when you've got a, a single source of flood risk so typically a, a river system for flood modeler and you want to evaluate the risk from there. So in this case, you'd go out, you'd uh, take some topographic survey, you'd take some cross sections of the channel and the floodplain and build yourself a, a, a 1D model of that. You generate some boundary information. So you'd create uh, some uh, blow or tidal boundaries, attach them to your model and run it. The model would run those boundaries through uh, and wherever the channel capacity was less than the inflow, you get out of bank flooding, which we model either in 1D or 2D, and then you could flood map that. And that's that's the standard traditional approach to flood risk uh, mapping, and it works great where you've got a, a single source of risk, a river, uh, less so where you've got distributed risks or multiple sources of risk. And that's where you need to look at a different approach. So moving away from the traditional approach, what if you, you need to model other things? So uh, these are the typical examples of where that traditional approach doesn't work. So you've got pluvial risk. Uh, this is where you've got intense rainfall over an area, usually a, a, an impermeable area, so you don't get much in the way of infiltration. That water uh, mobilizes over ground, flows to low areas, and generates a significant flood risk. Um, married to pluvial uh, risk, you've got urban risk. So this is uh, the risk of both the intense rainfall, but that's combined with uh, all the features you find in an urban area. So you have lots of obstructions, walls, roads, buildings, as well as the subsurface network. You've got the pipes, which are moving water around, so sewers, highway drainage, and changing the pattern of flood risk. So on the, on the left-hand side, you've got an example of a, a nicely surcharging manhole there, sort of moving the water uh, around your catchment. Another typical problem we have where the sort of the traditional approach doesn't work is where you're assessing the changes to your catchment. So that may be future development. So I've, I've got this big catchment. I want to build 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 houses in there. How is that going to change how the catchment responds? How is that going to change risk across the catchment? Uh, and also natural flood management, NFM. So uh, rather than uh, building new houses, I want to slow the flow within my catchment. I want to see what the uh, the impact, the benefit of sort of planting up large amounts of trees, building woody dams, and other interventions will be. Uh, and really, you can't do that with the sort of traditional uh, methods. Another good uh, use of uh, 2D is non-standard catchments. Uh, so this is where you've got um, uh, the usual problems. You've got small, altered, highly permeable catchments which don't lend themselves very well to the traditional methods of hydrological analysis or modeling. Um, and in all these circumstances, direct rainfall modeling can help solve these problems. It's another tool available to us. There are a whole host of issues to consider before you start undertaking uh, direct rainfall modeling. Um, so you could consider all the processes that are going on in the catchment, all the detail and the complexities that are going on within the catchment when you're applying rainfall and infiltration. So we just step through some of these quickly. Um, the first issue is obviously rainfall. This is um, this is the main boundary for your model. Where's that? Where's that going to come from? Um, this can either be observed. So if you've got a, a rain gauge in your catchment, you may be able to apply an observed rainfall. But more traditionally, we want to apply uh, a design rainfall. So we want to be able to say this is the uh, the one in a 100 year rainfall with a 10 hour storm duration. Um, and so how are they calculated? If it's observed, hopefully you've got a rain gauge you can use, but you still have to be cautious about the quality of that data. Is the gauge in your catchment? What's the spatial variation in rainfall across your catchment? 
do you need to make adjustments for it? If it's design, we normally take that from a, an IDF curve, so an intensity, duration, frequency curve. In the UK, that would be uh, the FEHDDF approach. And for a given storm duration and rarity, that will give you a depth of rainfall. Once you've got your, your depth of rainfall, you need to work out how to distribute it across your catchment, both in terms of time and space. So uh, the time element is the shape of your hydrograph. So on the left-hand side, we've got a very, uh, standard trapezoidal hydrograph out of uh, RFH. Uh, I'll be showing you how to apply that to the model later on. Um, in terms of spatial distribution on a small catchment, you're not going to get much variation in the rainfall intensity across it. But on a big catchment, you so you're modeling huge catchments, you're going to get quite a bit of spatial variation. You need to consider, do I need to apply one storm duration or multiple durations in different depths across there? When we talk about um, gross or net, so gross is uh, where we apply the, the total uh, depth of rainfall calculated by our IDF curve, whereas net is when we've made uh, deductions from that to account for infiltration, error reduction, and other processes, which I'll talk about shortly. Another key consideration besides the rainfall is infiltration. Not all the water that hits the ground uh, will run off. A lot of it will be uh, infiltrated into the subsurface, and we need to capture that. Otherwise, we're going to overestimate our risk. Uh, there are two broad ways of doing it. You could um, directly model that. So in, I'll show you how to do that later. We're going to apply infiltration losses within our 2D hydraulic model. So to directly suck water out of the, of the model. Or you could uh, deduct it as an input from the input. So you can apply a reduction to your gross rainfall to allow for the amount of infiltration. So if you need spatially varying losses, you really need to directly model that, uh, that infiltration. Base flow is another consideration. So uh, an example I used earlier about looking at uh, NFM, you're interested in what the total flow coming out of your catchment is. And base flow, the subsurface hydrologies, that can be a significant component of that. Um, we don't model that in on the surface, but we can use some of the other components within flood modelers, such as the rainfall runoff models, to calculate our base flow for us uh, and consider that. If you've got a small area looking at pluvial risk, base flow is not going to be an issue you need to consider. Drainage systems are a, a major consideration for urban modeling. Uh, so this is the pipe network under the ground. And as with the other uh, components, you can either model those directly using a 1D urban solver. So you can model the pipe network. Obviously, you need quite a bit of data to do that. And it could be quite time consuming to configure those networks. Or as with infiltration, you can make an allowance within your system. So you could, uh, if you know the capacity of that drainage system in terms of its uh, service, so it's uh, got a one in 30 year standard uh, it can provide, you could deduct, deduct that uh, that depth from your rainfall or apply an infiltration loss to account for it. Surface hydraulics are very important. So um, which bits do we consider? So you've got issues such as surface storage. So we've got a, a picture on the left showing uh, depressional storage around trees. Um, if you've got a large forested area, that can be quite a significant amount of attenuation uh, provided there. You've got obstructions. So in urban areas, you've got walls, you've got buildings, you've got roads all changing the flow paths and routes. And you may have things like railway embankments, road embankments, which further obstruct flow. As well as capturing the obstructions, you also need to capture routes around them. So if you've got embankments, you may have culverts underneath them, which allow flow through. So there's, there's quite a lot to consider when you're starting these studies, a lot of data to collect and a consideration as to which elements are relevant to your study. Worth touching on some of the alternatives as well, just briefly. So. Um, the other uh, hydrological methods, we, we tend to look at our statistical methods where we look at uh, historic observed flow and calculate uh, design flows off the back of those, so FEH statistical. Uh, that works really well, but it's, it's backwards looking. It can't be used to test things like NFM or impacts of uh, change to your catchment, and it's more predicated around large rural river systems. There's a whole range of lumped conceptual models, many of them built into uh, flood modelers such as uh, FEH and SCS methods. And they can provide flows for you and, and be and components of them can be used within the direct rainfall modeling and I'll, I'll demonstrate that later and there are other sort of distributed and semi-distributed hydrological models you can consider such as a dynamic top model uh, grid to grid and others um, which could be considered as part of your study assuming that you've decided uh, direct rainfall modeling is the way forward um, how how do i do it how do i apply this within flood modeler so I'm going to give you two demonstrations. The first one's going to be how to build a direct rainfall model within Flood Modeler, looking at all the data you need, and then we'll look at infiltration uh, after that. So Flood Modeler can apply a direct rainfall to a 2D surface. And as I said earlier, that's excellent for looking at pluvial, urban, and natural flood risk management uh, studies. 
what data do I need? Um, all the examples I've done today are using freely available data. So these are UK uh, examples using uh, open source data. The first data set I'm going to use is uh, topographic, so I need to define my surface. To do that, I'm going to use LiDAR. In this case, I've grabbed that from the DEFRA data portal and, and downloaded it. I've also got some ground data, so I've got uh, uh, mapping data and other data types to refine the representation of my, uh, my surface. I need some land usage data, and this is to define the roughness of my ground, the rate at which water can propagate along the, along the ground. And that can be defined uh, either using mapping data, so uh, where you've got roads and buildings, or you can use things like aerial data. You can use aerial photography or satellite sense data to define the, the roughnesses on the ground using a, a raster lookup. And you need rainfall data. You need your input to your model. So um, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be design. Uh, so you can use one of the rainfall runoff units uh, within Flood Modeler, so SCS or RFH, to be issue a design rainfall, or it could be observed data if you've got a gauge within your catchment. Before I launch into live demo, I'll just quickly let you know what I'm going to do. So I'm going to show you how to uh, set up your model, how to define the active area. I'm going to show you how to build up your topography, so how quick it is to build some quite complex topography within Flood Modeler, including local adjustments. I'm going to define my surface roughnesses uh, using, again, various GIS layers, and then set up my, uh, my boundary layer and, and run the hydraulic model. So on with the demo. Always, always a risk to do a live demo in front of a few hundred people, but I'm up for a challenge. So this is Flood Modeler 4.6, the most current version of the software uh, available, released a, a few weeks ago. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is switch on the base mapping. So this is built into Flood Modeler. I could have got uh, aerial mapping and base mapping, and I'm going to look at an area called Upton upon Seven. So this is a small town on the right bank of the River Seven in the UK. It's at significant uh, risk of flooding from the river, but it also has surface water risk as well. And what I want to do is build a 2D model of this area. I'm going to bring in some GIS data. Um, so I'm going to go to my Sorry, it's navigating to the right folder. So I'm going to bring in some LiDAR first. So I've got uh, two sets of LiDAR available for me. Um, I've got some 50 centimeter LiDAR, which is uh, which uh, which covers uh, a good chunk of my catchment. And then I've got some one meter LiDAR, which has got better coverage. So I've got high resolution LiDAR covering part of my catchment and one meter LiDAR covering all of my catchment. Sorry, I've just noticed I loaded in the wrong uh, LiDAR file. So that's the one I wanted. Sorry about that. Okay. So that's going to give my base DTM. I've also got a few GIS files I've, I've got as well. Uh, so I've got a, some shape files to define um, some topographic features. So I've got one for roads, and I'm going to use that to depress my road network in my 2D model. And I've got another for buildings as well. I'm going to use that to raise buildings up to represent the threshold of those buildings and the impediment to flow they represent. Uh, and then I've got some files I'm going to use to represent the roughness within my catchment. So I've got different types of surface, and I want to apply different roughnesses to those, and I use GIS files to set those up. Let's have a quick look at the uh, the topography files. So I've got a roads depress layer and a buildings raise layer. These are all open OS data, so these are from the uh, Ordnance Survey website, and it's all free data. If I have a look at the buildings raise layer and look at the, uh, the attributes for that, I've added two new fields within Flood Modeler using the, the editing tools. I've added a methods field and a height field. So uh, height is all set at 0.2, and method is also set it as add. So what will happen wherever there's a, a building uh, present and the add method, the underlying DTM will be raised up by 200 mil to represent the, uh, the building. If I filter that by height, you can see there are several buildings where I've specified um, an elevation but no add method. In this case, I knew the height of those buildings, so maybe from topographic survey, and therefore I'm going to raise those buildings specifically to that height rather than adding an amount onto the underlying DTM. I've got the same for my roads layer, where I've got two new attributes, the method and the add, and in this case, I'm, I'm removing 100 mil, so 0.1 meters of elevation from my DTM, so the roads become a preferential flow path. So when the water lands on the on the model, they'll uh, tend to root onto the roads and be rooted on the roads as the preferential flow route. 
In addition to those layers, I've got a couple of layers I'm going to use to specify uh, roughness, Manning's values. So I've got uh, roads, green spaces, and buildings. And you can add more of these if you want to. I've just used a, a handful uh, as a demonstration. Again, these are downloaded straight from the OS website. This is all openly available data. And all I've had to do is, if I look at the attributes, is to add a, um, a value field at the end. And this is the roughness of that, uh, of that underlying layer uh, expressed as a Manning's value. And I can vary it for all the components within here as well. That's all I need to get going. So I'm going to build my 2D model. So if I right click on simulations and choose new 2D simulation, uh, I need to give it a, a name. So I'm going to call it uh, Upton. And my new 2D simulation appears in, in the table of contents. I double click on it and I get the uh, 2D build interface. And this is really easy to use. So on the first tab, all I have to do is specify the start and end time. So start at zero hours and finish at, say, six hours. Under the domains tab, this is when we add a lot more detail. So I start building my model up. So the first thing I want to do is bring in my uh, LiDAR. So I'm going to bring in my one meter LiDAR first, and then my 50 centimeter LiDAR. The way these are stacked defines the way, order in which they're loaded in. So the one meter LiDAR comes in first, which has got the greater coverage, and then the higher resolution 50 centimeter LiDAR comes in and will replace the one meter wherever there is, is 50 meter coverage. I'm then going to bring in my uh, rose to pressure layer and my buildings raise layer. Um, and I can carry on adding these and I can add in Z lines and uh, polygons and all other sorts of complexities to really enhance my underlying DTM. The next thing I need to do is define the area of which I'll be working. Um, so my active area, I haven't got a polygon for that. So I'm going to create one. So back into flood modeler. And in flood modelers from the 2D build, I can choose active area, click that button, uh, give it a name. Uh, so let's call it active. And I just digitize a polygon, which defines the extent of my 2D model. So this is the area under which 2D calculations will be applied. And I'll make that uh, a bit bigger than it needs to be to start with. Save that and exit. I can bring my interface back over and I can drag and drop that active area into my, into my box. And that set it all up. Specify a grid size. I think I'll go for a four meter grid size and a two second time step. And then finally, I need to find my roughness data. So I can apply a global roughness of uh, say 0 0.03 and then drag in my other files to refine that. So I need to specify these are roughness polygons. So I've got the roads, I've got the green spaces, and I've got the buildings. So in a few minutes, I've managed to set up uh, a reasonably complex model using uh, two different resolutions of LiDAR layers to represent buildings and roads, as well as a well-defined uh, roughness distribution. And I can carry on adding complexity of this as I go. Next thing I need is some, some boundary information, so some rainfall to apply. So this is done under the rainfall tab. There are numerous ways of doing this. In this instance, I'm going to use a polygon to define the area over which my rainfall is going to be applied. And I'm going to use uh, um, a rainfall runoff unit within Flood Modeler, so the uh, FEH rainfall runoff unit to provide my rainfall. So if I go back to the interface, I'm going to load in a event file I created earlier. So this is a, a little sub model. And within there, there are two boundaries, a uh, FEH rainfall runoff boundary, which is Ray UK centric, and a, an SCS rainfall runoff boundary, a gener generic rainfall runoff boundary, which is more globally applicable. So if I open up the, the rainfall runoff boundary, uh, I've got some catch up descriptors in here. And under rainfall, I've specified a uh, storm duration and a rainfall rarity. And those two things will allow me to calculate a, a rainfall to apply onto my model. I've also got a polygon uh, with the rainfall area defined, which I'll bring in as well. So I'm going to apply my rainfall in under that polygon I've just uh, imported. It's worth noting when you set up the polygon, you need to add an extra field called node, and that node name relates to the units within your 1D model. So you need that link so the software knows where to get the rainfall data from. Once you've got those two files, it's, it's again drag and drop. So I drag my rainfall into my, uh, into my uh, boundary, specify the location of the, the rainfall data, and that's it done. Um, Alternatively, I could have used a time series data, so a CSV file uh, with some uh, observed rainfall, some calculated rainfall, or I could have a user-entered rainfall height graph. I want to manually apply that data, but I'm going to stick with my 
uh, my rainfall runoff boundary. Click OK, click save, and if uh, and when I'm ready to click my uh, run my model, just click run, and it will it work through the calculations. I'm not going to run it now. It would, it would take a little while to run through, so we'll look at uh, how to set up infiltration, and then we'll look at some results. So going back to the presentation, that's how quick and easy it is to build the uh, the 2D component and the direct rainfall component. We now want to apply some infiltration. Uh, there are two ways of doing this. You can have a, a lumped uh, loss. That's where we use uh, the RFH unit or the rainfall runoff unit to calculate a lumped reduction. Or we can apply a spatial loss, in which case we can use the green amp or, or SCS methods to apply a spatially varying loss. You need um, two files to do this. You need um, a, a GIS files defining the spatial variation of your soil, so which, where different soil types are, and uh, a lookup table to find the infiltration parameters. So going back to Flood Modeler, let's have a look how you do that. So if I just uh, move back into the software, I've got a polygon uh, called uh, Upton Soil. Switch everything else off and switch that back on. You can see that several polygons, and in the attributes for those, under the GA index field, I've defined what soil type they are. So it's just a, a number to define the, the soil type. And then I've got a separate file which is a lookup file which is a sole data file just a little text file and within here each of those ga numbers are defined and then the different parameters that the green out method needs to calculate uh, the infiltration all this is well defined in the help file so if you want to do this yourself the, the uh, flood modeler help file will take you through the, these method these steps so to uh, incorporate that into my uh, into my model i go back into the 2d simulation and I can uh, drag and drop my uh, Upton soils into the interface. Uh, I'm going to choose this as a spatial loss, the green out method, and then I need to choose my choose my uh, soil shape file and my lookup table, and that's it set up. I'll just click OK. So I'm applying a direct rainfall over that area, and also an infiltration based on the underlying data using the green out method. So again, nice and easy and fast to set this up uh, in Flood Modeler. Once you've run the model, you'll, you can get look at your results. Um, a word of warning, when, you, when you're doing a direct rainfall model, the results look a lot different from a, a traditional model. So you're going to start when you, you're applying a shallow depth of water across every cell in your model. So when you first look at the results, they'll look a bit like uh, look at this. Everything will appear wet. So all of the active cells in your model will appear wet. And you need to apply some sort of filtering to, to understand the results. Again, you can do all that within Flood Modeler. So uh, under the Properties tab, you can apply a, um, a, a, a cutoff depth. So if I switch off all depths below, say, 0 0.02 uh, meters, that will tidy up the, uh, the results. And then I can see that's removed the water, which is appearing everywhere. And it allows me to focus on the, the areas of greatest risk and greatest depth. I can zoom in on that um, and adjust the color ramp. So in this case, I can see the, the flood risk as it appears. Um, so it, Obviously, uh, with a direct rainfall model, it's going to be the areas of greatest depression where the water will fill up and cause greatest risk. In this case, I'll switch on the background satellite imagery, again, built into Flood Modeler. And I've tweaked the color ramp to give me red colors where I've got depths over a few hundred millimeters. So it really shows uh, areas of greatest risk. Flood Modeler is great for producing these sorts of outputs. So I could export this as uh, grids, as rasters, as FLTs, shape files, uh, KMLs to go into Google Earth, or, or image files to go into reports. So it, all my modeling I can I can do in one location. Hopefully that's given you a, an understanding of how easy it is to set up these uh, direct rainfall models in Flood Modeler. Um, it's worth touching on some of the, the new features that are coming in version 5 of Flood Modeler later this year and the ones relevant to, to this sort of study. So the first thing that's coming is um, a major improvement to the 1D Urban Solver. So in the next release you'll be able to have a pipe network under the ground um, and you'll be able to run that directly within Flood Modeler, and you'll be able to model the subsurface pipe network and the connections back to the 2D surface. We're going to have faster models. So at the moment, the 2D solver is paralyzed. You can run it across multiple cores in your CPU. But in the next release, we'll have a GPU solver as well. So if you've got a decent graphics card in your computer, you can make use of the hundreds, if not thousands, of cores on that graphics card to give you a real speed bump in your 2D modeling allowing you to model bigger catchments or existing catchments at a far higher speed. 
And the other big change are embedded 1D elements. So if you've got a, an embankment in your model, uh, say a road embankment, and you want to put culverts under it, you can do that at the moment using the, the 1D solver. Uh, but we've introduced some new tools in the next release, which will make that a lot slicker and a lot faster to implement. So it's a lot easier to augment your 2D model with uh, surface, uh, both surface pipes, surface 1D components and subsurface components. And all that is, yeah, it should make these sorts of studies a lot more, uh, a lot more achievable. So just to recap, we go to questions. Um, hopefully I've explained uh, what the benefits of a 2D model are, the uh, applications and where you can use them, and demonstrated exactly how easy it is to build these models. So in a few minutes with the right data, you can quickly build a, a very detailed 2D model uh, to support your studies and your clients.